coming back to the book. So, so in the middle of all these um, ideas that it's what really uh, makes the complexity of our world and as well the opportunities. So to, to reach these seven principles, um, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of thinking because in the other day we can go through the United Nations uh, SDG, Sustainable Developing Goals. We can actually go through a lot of different areas that are kind of mainstream. Um, and of course, in history, there was always moments of uh, risk, moments of heresy, moments as well that shift uh, humanity for good and for bad. And actually, there's uh, in one of the biographies that I love from uh, um, Bazzari, from Leonardo da Vinci, and actually the, the three he did, there's always, always there's a certain point I, I'm going to quote by memory, but he was saying that uh, there's moments when ideas and art work together with money. There's ideas when um, <laughs> technology or ideas work with, with power, and then there's military and power. So we are in the kind of a bridge because of, at the same time, this, of course, in the end of the day, the elephant in the room, no one can ignore it. Uh, of course, AI is it's an, with a power that we never saw anything. And effectively, even a chat GPT-3, I'm not even for, can already kind of uh, write an entire book <laughs> if with a couple of special with people like us. Of course, it's very basic in a lot of ways. It can fake a lot of different things. But effectively, it processes information like any human, uh, at least language. Let's put it that way. That is called that's why it's called generative language. But during this process of research for these principles, how do you summarize in seven principles? I would like to see how you reach the seven principles. And of course, the idea is not to give away the book. It's open the ideas for reading the book. But uh, what would be the principles that you reach to, sh or the the summary capacity? Because there's a lot of work to get to this summary that you achieved in the book. Well, how do how should we structure this? Should we divide them? Oh, go ahead, Art. I, I'm very curious to see how you're going to answer the question. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, my questions are all too big. <laughs> no, no, this is great. No, because I've given this, I think, thought for a lot longer. But in terms of actually breaking down the principles, I think one of the, the strengths was that Art and I think so differently. Mm -hmm. So it was a constant back and forth where many times we didn't agree and we had to come back and reiterate and and be patient with each other. So how would you summarize the, the seven that we came up with? Be intentional about risk is choose the approach you take to what you release and what you use so that you are thinking about the consequences intentional and unintended and making choices about how much of those consequences you will tolerate and how you will avoid the negative ones. Um, you know, all of them, there's a lot to unpack, but that to me is the basics. Open the closed box is uh, make as much as possible explainable. Maybe parse, you know, who it, who is explainable to in certain cases, but allow for there to be a way to find out why this program was generated, what the logic was behind its choices, uh, including how the data was selected and, um, and massaged, and uh, what the model was intended to do, and include in that the gap between what the intention of the model is and the actual outcome of the model, and why does that gap exist. Um, then the third one is, um, the, uh, is uh, confronting question bias. And there, I think the, you know, humanity is biased, we're all biased. And to what extent can we safely and capably raise awareness of the biases that are there and eliminate or reduce the harmful effects that the bias has, to, you know, negative bias in particular to groups of people who might be excluded or ostracized or, you know, harmed because of biases against them, but not just biases against people, biases against um, types of action, you know, any bias that limits the value that we provide with the, with AI. And then, um, you know, reclaim ownership of data. This is, to me, this is the way I think of it is how great would it be 
if you had some simple app that could just say, you know, I want my data to be used here. It goes only so long. I don't want it to be used there. I want it to be used there with this nuance under these circumstances. And since you're paying for it to be marketed, I want a cut of it. And I want that to go into this bank account and make it easy. Make it as easy for me to control my data and have, you know, options for my data as you make it easy for me to give away my data. Um, accountability is really what mechanisms can we put in place so that people who misuse the technology either deliberately or through carelessness or because that's just not what we're thinking about or I'm delegating that to the risk department and not thinking about it again. What can we bring to bear to make sure that people feel the accountability? How, how would they compensate those who have been hurt or those who have been um, shut out because of it? And accountability is part awareness and part action uh, and then part regulation. And then uh, the, uh, the, the loosely coupled and tightly coupled systems the phrase comes from Charles Perrault, who studied nuclear power um, disasters. And this, to me, this is totally related to organizational design. Can we, I've been, I've worked for loosely coupled organizations and I've worked for tightly coupled organizations. And, you know, I'd rather be rich in my coupling. I'd rather have loosely coupled systems where, you know, you push a few dominoes over and the whole thing doesn't collapse, but where you have designs that allow for multiple ways of thinking about things and for fail-safe um, mechanisms that come into play. And then creative friction. Um, this came from a few places, including uh, some of the uh, people that you worked with, Juliet, and who practiced it. But to me, it comes also back to the concept of frictionlessness. And I had kind of gotten used to wanting the world to be as frictionless as possible. Just not why I don't. There's a great book on there's a great there's a there's a very popular book on user experience design called Don't Make Me Think. And I wanted to choose what I thought about and not think about what I didn't want to think about. One of the things I didn't want to think about was the software I used. I wanted it to be totally intuitive to the way I work, or I just wasn't interested. Um, that worked as long as I worked for a large corporation where the software was tailored to a common set of attitudes and ways of looking at things. When I left and was on my own, I had to pay attention for the first time in many years to the design of what was around me. I had to take, I had to think about it. It was no longer frictionless. And therefore that was a rude awakening and in some ways a recognition of uh, the way life is for most people and will probably be for all of us. Just because we have AI doesn't mean things are going to be frictionless now. In fact, quite the opposite. Now we're going to have to choose between 17 different life organizers and decide which one really fits, if we use one at all. Julia, do you want to add on this? Because I, I think it's an important consideration. I would like to hear from both of you. And I completely subscribe to what you said, Art, but it really opens a lot of questions. But I'll try to synthesize my next one. Well, I'll certainly let me jump in on the creative friction part. So again, I think that we threw in creative friction specifically because Art and I had massive creative friction as we were writing about frictionlessness <laughs> and this idea of control. Uh, and I think that that the idea that we are more in control because we have our digital devices, because we have a big buy button that we can press and that, you know, essentially we we allocate our, our decision making to systems that decide where we're going to live, who we're going to date, uh, you know, whether we quit our jobs or don't quit our jobs. We delegate a lot of important decisions to these systems. And at the same time, we don't necessarily do the cost benefit analysis that's necessary to truly be in control of something. You're just kind of ad hoc picking things on the fly, but you're not giving deep thought to it. And so one of the people that uh, was just really inspiring uh, in terms of an interview as we were wrapping up the book is with 
Professor Shinai Ngar. She's at Columbia Business School, and she's done a, a lot of research on this, research on what real control is and how it's a biological need that we all have. But again, as two authors who are trying to deliver something on deadline because we have a contract with the publisher, there was a lot of creative friction in how we were going to do that and both be satisfied with the results of the book. And so I went back to, um, yes, the way that we we worked in television, for example, where in Canada, I grew up with a, a very small television network, and just about everybody had actually studied television. I didn't. As I said, I saw somebody do an interview, and I just jumped in. And there was always this collaborative effort within the organization because you had the business side, you had the creative side, you had the fact that you were live, you had the advertisers. And so it was always this push and pull of how best to optimize in a live environment um, to give out the best product for everyone. And those lessons stayed with me so that when I started, for example, speaking with my friends in big tech, and I, I started asking, like, how do you make decisions about responsibility and how you go about things? But there's a lot of push and pull. And the more we deliberate, the better usually the results are for the larger amount of people in terms of who's buying our products, but also within the organization. And that reminded me of another professor that I had at Columbia. Professor David Stark, who had studied specifically what happened when uh, you had very diverse teams on Wall Street. And it might be counterintuitive because you think of people on Wall Street, the traditional thought is, oh, everybody's the same. They all look the same. They all have the same kind of education. Well, it turns out that the more diverse, and when I talk about diversity, I don't just mean gender. I don't just mean race. I'm talking about socioeconomics. Uh, we're talking about education, neurodiversity all of it. The more diverse the teams, the longer they deliberated because more questions would come up and what about this and what about that? But they made more money. They were more productive. The diversity worked better for them. And so Professor Stark, again, decided to see, is this just cultural? Is this just a bunch of Americans? No, he did the same kind of research on the Japanese stock exchange, the Tokyo Stock Exchange and found the same thing. And for me, in every organization that I've had the pleasure of consulting with, it's been the same thing. And so I started looking at big tech and is this creative friction truly kind of fundamental to making better decisions for more people and making more money? And the more I inquired, the more the answer came up as yes and yes. And that again, because of competition, that that's not always encouraged, but that's how um, in the past that they had done very, very well. And then I started talking to some of the R&D labs within big tech, whose timelines were less about the quarterly uh, impact of their decisions and more about the longer term and the medium term decisions for the organization. And also their, again, their reputation, what kind of uh, technology will they be launching in the next 10 years as opposed to the next three months? And their decision making did require much more of that um, tension, you know. And so being able to see it in a small organization like the organization in which Art and I and KPI, but also in large organizations, just made us realize that this uh, creative friction was incredibly important. And we don't hear as much about it as we should. Yeah, that's, uh, I think we all need the silence after this, both of your uh, answers, because there's a lot of things to process. Uh, and we are as well <laughs> machines of, of minds. Mm -hmm.